So here is the book of Amos, and I just want to give a quick overview of what's included in the book of Amos. So we have the study pack of inserts, and while I'm showing this, I want to say a quick thank you to Mo for being the sponsor of today's video. Thank you so much for your support of the channel. So here's the ending of Joel, and then here Amos starts. So in this, the first thing I wanted was a timeline of Amos, of where it falls in history. And so we see it's Jeroboam II. We can look to see when he reigned. Jeroboam was the king of Israel. Uzziah became the king of Judah. Amos began his prophetic ministry. Then we have Hosea, Micah, Isaiah, and then here was the Assyrian conquest of Israel. So a huge event in history. So I wanted that up at the top just to give me a feel for where we were in history. And I think this comes from the MacArthur Bible Commentary. I think these two items I found in the same spot. And this gives you an outline of the book. These were two other things from other places and I just made them yellow. They don't actually go with this. They aren't from the MacArthur Study Bible. Just some other things I found online. And I liked this one because the person said it was during the reign of King Jer poem the second and where you could find his reign in the old testament just to line it up with scripture i love chronological reading plans but it's just kind of nice if you're doing just a study of amos to kind of review where we are in time and then this is someone else's take on kind of a content outline so i liked having that in there too and then underneath this so it kind of goes along with these outlines at the top it shows some key verses and then in chapters one and two are these eight dooms i'll be showing this on a map and then on this we have five sermons and then five visions and then three promises. So we're on the inner part. So here we have two verses, Amos 1.1 1, 1 and Amos 7.14 that tell us who Amos is. And this box here is apparently also from the MacArthur Bible Commentary. I guess this information is from both of these, but it talks about who is Amos, when he prophesied, and who were the other prophets at that time, and the scriptural context those two places mentioned. So I like having that available for myself as well. Whenever I want to dig into Amos, here it is. So next, something interesting that I found is in Amos 1.1, and it's also mentioned in Zechariah 14.5, there's an earthquake that's mentioned, and there's actually information about that, so they think that happened in 760 BC. There's other supporting information for what's contained here, so if you want to look into that. And again, these are in words, so like, say you didn't want this in your Bible, you could take that out and add a map there, or whatever works for you. But what I did in my Bible is that I also went to Zechariah 14.5, and notated back to Amos 1.1, just so I have that information in both places of my Bible, I can link back to this and know some information about the earthquake because it was a huge event for them. Okay, so then found a set of two maps. Uh, this was one of them, and this is showing the Assyria, the conquest, how it came down, and you can even see Babylonia. What was neat about this map and another map is that it had these two little write-ups that were next to them, so I just cropped them so that they would appear underneath, just so I could still have that information and study it more in depth later. And just in case I haven't said this before, just send me an email, biblenotetakingwithkatie at gmail.com, and you can get any of these inserts for free. Just let me know that you want the Amos study pack and I will send that out to you. So this is another one that I found. It shows the chronology and then where we are and these pagan worship spots that they had and then the major kings of Israel. And so I liked that and I decided I wanted that in my Bible too. And this map I made really big. I wanted to fill the whole page because I added some text boxes on there. It was interesting because I found some maps had some information, other maps had other information, and I thought I instead of having eight maps, I decided let's just add text boxes to this map so that all the information is in one place. In that first page, we saw that there were those eight dooms, and so one of them was against Damascus, and this is where it was found. It was part of Aram. It was prophesied to be taken over by Syria. We also know in Dan there was that golden calf and that tear would be burned. So I tried to highlight those, but I just added text boxes. And then we have Israel and Samaria was actually the capital of Israel. Samaria is an interesting thing to look into. I've started to track that and to really look into the history of Samaria. Remember when Jesus was going through that area, his disciples weren't too thrilled about it and there were different things that happened. I'll definitely be having study sheets on that. Uh, and then also in Bethel, there was a golden calf. There's Ammon. There's judgment against Israel. In Jerusalem, that's where the temple was. 
Then there's some more prophecies and over here in Gaza. In my other Bible, I would kind of have information about the author and historical information up here at the top. But because I'm now doing all the inserts, I don't need it up there. It's in the inserts. And then I'm just highlighting as I need to. So on this page, I've added the notes that I have so far. And this is something that's going to grow over time. And I'll tell you some ideas of where I think in future times I'm going to be studying. But I'll just show you what I've notated so far. So here we have Amos. He's a herdsman of Tekoa, and we see that also in chapter 7, verse 14. So in that spot, I have it marking back to chapter 1, verse 1. And then here's that mention of the earthquake. So it's Zechariah 14, verse 5. And then I've also told myself that there's an insert there, a place that I want to add to it. And I was going to add it for this, is where do we see in the Bible Jeroboam, Uzziah, and Joash? One thing is that in my set of inserts, it references where you read about Jeroboam, but I'd want to have each of those kings listed over here just so I can get some backstory as I'm reading this. I might just go read that section in Kings or wherever it might be. Jeroboam is actually mentioned in 2 Kings. And the thing that's interesting about that, this is 2 Kings. And here in verse 2, we're seeing a reference to Mount Carmel. Big thing about this part is I want to remember that Mount Carmel is where there was that big struggle between Elijah and the prophets and Elijah declares to them how much longer you're going to halt between two opinions which is the real God and that's something we're going to see in Armageddon because Megiddo I'll show this on the map Megiddo is right next to Mount Carmel and so anyways I just want to remember that story so when I was originally going through this this was just a mix of areas and then I realized because of the map that I have to the side. So Damascus, that area is verses three through five, and I've underlined some of the areas, but then I circled here just to show this is that section. So I'm just sectioning it off for myself. The one thing I might wanna go back later as I'm studying and find out, is there anything in the Bible showing when they did these things to Gilead? Is there anything more, any more information? The house of Haziel, is that also mentioned in the Bible somewhere? Ben-Hadad, those kind of things. Sometimes you find a lot more information. So here, verses six through eight, starts the section on the Philistines. So I've just underlined the places, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and those are on the map. And then fire is a word also that I track. Fire is something that comes up in Revelation. So I've marked that with, with an underline of orange and the circle in red, and that's up in verse four as well. So six through eight is the Philistines. Then verse nine through 10 is Tyrus or Tyre on the map. And there's also the word fire here. And then verses 11 through 12 is Edom. And there's the word fire and there's Teman, which appears on the map. There's the word sword here. And that's also a symbol I'm tracking. So I marked it with that. The underline of pink, the circle of brown, and then the highlight in with the yellow. So that's verses 11 through 12. And then verses 13 through 15 are about the areas of Ammon. And then we have Moab and some of the areas we find on the map like Kiriath. There's fire with that underline of orange and the circle of red in both chapter 1 verse 14 and chapter 2 verse 2 and then here's that word trumpet that comes up in Revelation so that's highlighted in yellow underlined in pink and then circled in brown and trumpet what you find out about that that is often when God takes care of the enemies of God so in Revelation there are the churches the seals and the trumpets and so the trumpets are actually all against the enemies of God so but that that would be too much to go into right now, but that's why I highlight that. I just want to see how that word is used in the Bible throughout the Bible. So anytime I see that word, I make it stand out for myself. So here in chapter 2, verse 4 through 5, we have doom proclaimed on Judah. That's the large area here. And here's Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. So then we have the judgment on Israel, verses 6 through 8 and 13 through 16. And then here in chapter 2, verse 11, it says, And I raise up your sons for profit, and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink, and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. 
So this he gave the Nazarites wine to drink. That stuck out to me. The Nazarite vow is found in Numbers 6, 1 through 12. And in it, they do things like not drinking wine, not drinking anything connected to the grape, not cutting their hair. So that's in Numbers 6, verses 1 through 12. And especially verse 3 has to do with the wine to drink. And then we have an example of a Nazarene in Judges 13. And verses 5 through 7 specifically talk about how Samson is going to be a Nazarite from birth and not drink wine and not cut his hair, those kind of things. So what's interesting about that is in Numbers 6, it says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow, a vow of a Nazarite to separate themselves unto the Lord. So this was something, we had the Levites who were separated because they were by birth. But this is any person, if you wanted to separate yourself unto the Lord and make a vow to be connected to God, you made a choice to separate yourself from wine and strong drink liquor of grapes, not eating moist grapes or dried grapes. There were all of these things that were connected to being a Nazarite. And this is something that you chose to do. So when we look in Amos, these are people who have made a choice to separate themselves to God. And he's saying to Israelites, you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets saying, prophesy not. So here we have these Nazarites and the prophets that the Israelites are interfering with. So here in chapter 3, verse 6, we see this reference to the trumpet being blown in the city and about the evil. So again, about that the trumpet has to do with the people of God and protecting them, or that it also can mean that the people of God should proceed. There's lots of different ways that trumpet is used. And so these are one of my favorite sets of verses to show how we know that this God is different than any other God. But there are some other verses that are even more clear, but it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken. Who can but prophesy? So if you've seen my color coding system, you know the word of God, I do with an underline of blue, an underline of red, and then the box in of brown. And so prophecy is in yellow. So in this place, I want to remember that God's people are ones of prophecy. So I wrote that on here. God's people have the commandments of God and the prophecy. And you find that out in Revelation 12 verse 17, that the people of God have the commandments of God plus the testimony of Jesus. And then in Revelation 19 verse 10, we're told that the testimony of Jesus is prophecy. So God's people have commandments plus prophecy. We need to have both. We have those commandments written into our heart. So that's something else that I might add into this. I want to remember where in the Bible does it say that the commandments are going to be in our heart? It's just I want to remind myself of that as often as possible. So I have a whole blank page from chapter 3 verse 12 through 4 verse 9 and it continues on to 10 verse 11 and in verse 13 I have underlined the Lord, the God of hosts is his name. The Lord is a H3068, and that's Jehovah. The God is H430. Elohim of hosts is H6635. I don't know how to pronounce it, but Saba, something like that. Is his name is H8034. And that I found some different spellings for that S H A M E S E M or S H E M. So it means fame or renown. So this is Jehovah Saba, which you'll see in the Bible. So I've written to reference 1 Samuel 17 verse 45. And so that's a section where David fought against Goliath. And he actually references Jehovah Saba and another name. And it's very interesting. I never noticed he was calling on the names of God. That's a really cool section. I just don't have it ready yet. I think I'm going to create an insert for that because it just really was powerful to me. It's interesting how much Jehovah Saba is seen in the Bible. So I kind of want to have that notated into an insert. I just don't have that yet. Maybe when I get to 1 Samuel, that will be something that I'll focus in on doing. But I like seeing these names of God and knowing the shortened version of it because this is a lot of words, but you actually see it referred to as Jehovah Saba. So in chapter 5 verse 6, there's the word fire. And so now we have chapter 5 verse 7. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. And this would not have stood out to me except I've studied Revelation. And wormwood is something that is in Revelation. So I want us to go to Revelation 8 verse 11. We're going to take a look at that verse. And I haven't marked it up, but I thought I would just show you the verse itself. 
So chapter 8, verse 11 in Revelation, it says, And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters become Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So remember those terms. We have Wormwood, Waters, and Bitter. So back here in Amos chapter 5, verse 7, I have Wormwood has to do with leaving off righteousness. And I have a note to go to Revelation 8, 11. And then what I did, and I did not do it as neatly as I wished I had done. And the reason it ended up so messy like this is because I'd had a few notated in my original study Bible. But then as I went to new sections, I found more verses referenced. So this is me accumulating my notes into this spot. So maybe at some point I'll be transferring notes from this Bible into another one and I'll be neatening that up so it's like every time I'm going to improve on the previous Bible but I'm hoping this Bible is good enough for a while but so these are where we see those references so at each of these sections my goal is to have it refer back to Amos chapter 5 verse 7 and I'll show you how I did that at one spot so I'm going to go over to Proverbs 5 4 so here in Proverbs 5 4 we learn a little bit more about wormwood or just enhances our understanding of this concept of wormwood the more we see it throughout the Bible and we see how it's used in Scripture we can have a deeper understanding when we come to a book like Revelation that is full of symbols and we can have just that deeper understanding of what we're reading so here in chapter 5 verse 4 Four, we see, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. So here in this, I want to remember that concept of bitter as wormwood. So I've underlined it in orange because it has to do with sin. Bitter as wormwood, and I boxed in wormwood. And on top of it, I've written Amos 5, 7, so I can remember to go back to that part. So in each of those places, I'm having myself go back to Amos 5, 7 because I want to be reminded of Revelation, and I want to be reminded of this story in Exodus that we'll look at in a few minutes. I just want to take a moment while we're here and since we're here to look at this concept as sharp as a two-edged sword. So remember up here, the start of Proverbs 5 is we're learning about wisdom. And then in verse 3, it says, For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. Her mouth is smoother than oil. This makes me think of the Antichrist system. A woman in prophecy has to do with a church. So a strange woman, her mouth is smoother than oil. Remember that Antichrist system sends out false doctrine and teachings to itching ears that want to hear it. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. And I haven't notated this in my Bible. I'm just going to wait, but I'm going to show you something. This two-edged sword, this is also connected to Revelation. So this is Revelation 1.16, and it's a description of Christ. And it says, And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. There's another symbol to be tracking. We also can look at a verse, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Jesus has has out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. So now back here in Proverbs 5 verse 4, it says, But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. We know that the Antichrist system causes deception. And the only antidote to that is Christ and the truth of who Christ is. And his love doesn't mean a free-for-all. There is a standard, the Ten Commandments. What you're going to see throughout the Bible is not that we can say, all that you say, we will do. That was the first covenant. The people said, all that you say, we will do. That isn't going to work. It was something they tried. It, it's just not going to work. We need Christ. We need God to write his laws on our hearts so that we don't even think about doing right or wrong. That we're walking in the truth. The problem is if we look at the Ten Commandments and say that's not really important anymore uh, we're gonna change it even though God wrote it in stone with his finger we're gonna take certain ones out and not follow them that's where we're getting in trouble because how can God work with that if we say no he, he just can't do anything with that we have to be open to God changing us and to changing our heart and to say I truly want to know what does God say to me not what does man say but what does God say so her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. And we're going to see this more. We're going to go to Exodus, but let's go back to Amos 5, 7. There's so much more to this. 
So here at Amos 5-7, I'll read you what I have here. I have Revelation 8-11, Lamentations 3, verse 15 and 19, Proverbs 5, verse 4, Deuteronomy 29-18, Jeremiah 9-15, and Jeremiah 23-15. So those are all spots that we can see more about this wormwood. And we won't go to all those spots, but you can explore those on your own. So with this wormwood and leaving off righteousness, this has to do with that licentious living and just saying, I'm going to live how I want to live and God is going to accept me because I believe that there is a God. That's good enough. I said at one point, the sinner's prayer, I believe there's a God and that's all there is to it. Even the demons believe and tremble. So there's more to it than what the demons are doing. And we also, we don't want to get into trying to do in our own power. I can't say that enough. So let's just look at Jeremiah 23, 6, because we want to remember Christ is our righteousness. We cannot be our own righteousness. So Jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6. Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. So righteous is H6662. And a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice. And in NKJV it says righteousness in the earth. Verse 6. In his days Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So remember our righteousness is our own personal righteousness is filthy rags. We need the Lord's righteousness. It's not by our merits outside of ourselves. This righteousness is right doing and we can't do it. Jesus filled up the requirements of the law on behalf of the human race as a man. Remember, he's our kinsman redeemer. He took on our flesh. So we can't do this righteousness. I realize I need to add a little note here. Isaiah 64, 6, our righteousness is filthy rags. So in this about Wormwood, I want to be reminded of something in Exodus 15 verses 22 through 26. And this is because it's about the water without the tree and it, Jesus is the green tree. You see that in Luke 23, 31. Well, we will see that, but I want to go over to Exodus 15 verses 22 through 26. And this is all to help me understand Revelation 8, 11. So these are the notes that I have for this section so far. So in verse 22, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statue and an ordinance and there he proved them and said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians for I am the Lord that heals thee. And so when I've read that in the past, I didn't get it. There was this whole thing. He cleansed the water. What did that have to do with keeping of the commandments? And what I've since learned is a lot of of what happened with the Israelites, the reason why God did things a certain way, like why did he have them stop at Mara where the waters are bitter? Why didn't he take them to a place like in verse 27? Why didn't he take them directly to Elam where there were 12 wells of water and there were palm trees and plenty of good water? Why did he take them to the place of bitter water? And it was to show them, which would then teach us these deep truths of God. So we have waters that are bitter and a tree is placed in the water to make it sweet. So what I have on here, I want to be reminded of Revelation 8, 11 that we were looking at, that wormwood. It's a Christless religion. It's bitter because they aren't keeping the commandments. This bitter water has to do with not keeping the commandments. So I have reference to go back to Amos 8, verses 11 through 12 that we've been looking at. And then there's Proverbs 25, verse 26. So again, in Proverbs 25, verse 26, we see a righteous man falling down before the wicked is a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. So remember, those waters are bitter. They're corrupt. This all has to do with righteousness. So I have to see notes in Exodus 15, verses 22 through 26 to get more information. I want to tie myself back so when I come to this, I can be reminded of those bitter waters at Mara and how there was the green tree that was placed in it to make the water sweet and good. So now here we are back at Exodus. We have this tree. 
So let's go to Luke 23, verse 31. So now in Luke chapter 23, this whole section is about Jesus being crucified at Calvary. Jesus says this statement, But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. That's in Revelation. I haven't marked this part of my Bible up. Verse 31, For if they do these things, things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? There is a whole section of notes that I have on this about the dry tree. Jesus is the green tree and the dry tree are those who have fallen away like the Israelites at this time who are participating in crucifying Christ. But so Jesus is the green tree. So here we have in Revelation 22, 14, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So we have here, we're seeing again the tree and they're keeping the commandments. So the gospel of Christ is made sweet and alive by the sacrifice of Christ. The sweet waters are keeping the commandments of God. So we have the faith of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus, that prophecy that I was showing you earlier. I just want to notate that. So I want to show you one more spot related to this. Not only is Christ the green tree, but we as believers become green trees. We can look at that in Psalm 1 verse 3. So I just, I don't know how many people have thought about that, about the green tree, that, that concept in scripture but it says blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly nor standeth in the way of sinners nor sit in the seat of the scornful so i've written here just for myself believers do not meditate on the things of this world so he's not mindful he's not dwelling on it but his delight is the law of the lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night God writes the laws on our hearts. So he hasn't done away with the laws, the Ten Commandments, but he's written them on our hearts. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So if your leaf is not withering, you're green and you're, you're a green tree and you have fruit. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so here I have a note to myself about stand to see the insert at Ephesians 6 verses 13 through 14. And chaff, I'm reminded of Daniel 2 35 where the chaff are blown away. So all of these concepts of scripture come back over and over again and the meanings of them deepen as you see them throughout scripture. So one thing I wanted to add on here at verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So I just want to remind my Myself, the law is on our hearts and minds because God has placed them here. So I have up here as my note, God will write his laws on our hearts and minds. We see that in Jeremiah 31 verse 33, Ezekiel 11 verse 9 and 36 verse 26, Romans 2 15, 2 Corinthians 3 3, Hebrews 8 10 and chapter 10 verse 16. So he's going to write his laws on our hearts and minds. And then I want to also be reminded that we can't do any of this on our own own. Christ is our righteousness. And so adding on there, I realize I want to remember where that verse is in Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 6, which says that our righteousness is filthy rags. So it's all Christ. And this is when I'm writing an orange color about sin. I write in black because the orange for me just wasn't working in my other Bible uh, because, you know, black is darkness and is darkness and God is light. So that's why I did that with black and orange, linking them together. But as you can see, I've left myself plenty of room here to add more. I haven't really dug into this Christ, our righteousness, to find all the verses I would want to connect with this theme. So I might add more. As you can see here, I have a little bit of a mess because I had tried to write these verses here, right out here, and it ended up coming up here. And I realized I wanted about Christ, our righteousness, and filthy rags, and all of that. So and I realized I wanted to add in more information. So I just moved it over to here, and I used the whiteout tape, which is this right here. 
And I'll just go through and touch this part up because it should say Joshua 1.8 there. So I think a lot of times when we think about the law being in our hearts, we can kind of get overwhelmed with this idea of doing it on our own or that it's all been nailed to the cross. So I just want you to remember that proverb that says that a righteous man falls seven times and gets back up, but a wicked man falls and stays down. So that's where God's grace comes in. So we can become licentious and say it's all grace and I don't have to worry about doing good. And I know someone who considers himself a Christian and he's gonna be in heaven, but he owns a strip bar. He's just, he's not walking with the Lord in any way, but because he said the sinner's prayer at one point in his life, that's good enough for him. And so I don't see that in the Bible. I actually see in Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23. And it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. And it says, They prophesied in thy name, in thy name have cast out devils, and thy name done many wondrous works. And Christ tells them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So they're doing all these wonderful things in the name of the Lord, but they're working iniquity. So this person I was talking about, he's the one that brought my husband to church for the first time, but he does not believe that we need to be reaching towards God, asking him to help us, to change us. He's going to keep living his life the way it is. This isn't to be condemning. God is not condemning. It is just we need to be clinging to him for help in changing us and he's the one that does all the work but if we've hardened our hearts and we say no this is the way i'm gonna stay that's the difference we just stay and wallow in the mud god can't do anything with us and that's just a choice that we can make that god gives us that freedom to make the choice do i want to follow god or my own ways and i can't even follow god on my own i need his help so that's where prayer comes in and reading the bible all of those things so we can see god more and more clearly and he, we can allow him to change us because we see how beautiful the truth is and then here in jeremiah 17 verses 7 through 8 we see the same concept blessed is the man that trusts in the lord and whose hope the lord is for he shall be a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see or fear is what the NKJV says, when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful or anxious, the NKJV says, in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. Here we see again that believers are likened to a green tree. And so I've reminded myself that Jesus is a green tree, back in Luke 23 verse 31, that believers are a green tree, and that I can look to that story, Exodus 15 verses 22 through 26 just to bring myself back to those notes so i just want to visit exodus one more time before we go back to amos so here we have these bitter waters and the green tree is put in and when we look through scripture we see that bitter is not keeping the commandments of god that this tree that is placed in it represents christ is the green tree we see that throughout scripture and we believers are the green tree and that we'll be keeping the commandments of god but in revelation there are those bitter waters and people are straying from the truth and so I want to go back to Amos now so when I went back to Amos I realized I should have written Amos 5 7 I wrote the wrong place here so I've whited it out and added Amos 5 7 so in those parts in the video I'll just write on the screen it's actually Amos 5 7 so now let's go back to Amos and so I just find it fascinating the way all of scripture lines up with itself I can't say that enough it's just it's very exciting to me this little treasure here. So continuing on in Amos 5, we have the Lord God of hosts, that's Jehovah Elohim Saba, that's Jehovah Saba. And I have that linked back to 1 Samuel 17 verse 45 about King David. So anytime I see this phrase, I'm going to link back to that and that's where I'm going to have information on this name of God. Here in Amos 5 verses 18 through 20, we have the day of the Lord. And when I do this, I underline it with orange and then with red and then box it in with yellow because in that day of the Lord, actually we see it here as darkness and not light. It's going to be judgment. So I want those phrases to stand out. 
So here in Amos chapter 6, verses 8 and 14, we see this, the Lord God of hosts, the Lord God of hosts. So I just want to remind myself that it links back to 1 Samuel 17, 45. I didn't bother to write it up here because I'm going to be able to see it here, but I could do that. Here in Amos 7, verse 4, I see the word fire. Oh, this is interesting. In verse 8, it says, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. And the high places of Isaac, remember those high places are where they're sacrificing children. So that might be something that I'm going to note back to the pass through the fire study. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So I have that with the highlight of yellow, underlined in pink, and then boxed in in brown. So here in Amos chapter 8 verses 4 through 6. I have a sticky note here. It's talking about falsifying the balances by deceit and we read about that in Revelation 6 6 but it's not something I'm ready to write into my Bible so I just have that on a sticky note. And then the reason I'm notating this is that it says, when will the new moon be gone? And new moon is mentioned in Isaiah 66, 23, that we may sell corn or in the new King James, it says grain and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephath small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. So it's all about taking advantage of people. Uh, we see also that buying and is prohibited on the Sabbath in Jeremiah 17 verse 27 and Nehemiah 10 verse 31. So in each of those spots, I also added the reference from Amos 8 verse 5. So down here in Amos 8 verse 11, I have behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So words of the Lord I've highlighted, underline of blue, an underline of red and then boxed in in brown. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. In Revelation 6, 6, we see that famine of the true word of God. Okay, so before I move on though, every time I read this, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. So yes, there's gonna be that famine of the true word that we find in Revelation 6, 6. But we are promised something in Daniel 12, 4. And so I just want to go there and show you that. And so there's a lot to this. I haven't underlined, I haven't marked in Daniel. Daniel and Revelation are books that I'm going to really come to very slowly. But it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. And we see in Revelation a book that had been sealed and then opened. So that's just a little uh, something coming. But um, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Increased. So there is going to be this time where there's a famine of the true word of God. And if you look at time, there is this period of the dark ages where it was illegal to even own the Bible. But there was a breaking through of that. And the knowledge has been increasing since then. People are putting these symbols together and realizing the truth of God and all this beauty that's in the Bible. Something I heard recently, this many shall run to and fro, is that the Bible didn't used to be a single book. It was scrolls and they were long scrolls. It was handwritten, of course. So the idea of seeking knowledge from all of what God has for us, it wasn't a matter of flipping the pages back and forth. It was searching the scrolls and going from one table with scrolls to another table with scrolls to find all of the knowledge and put it together. So that's what I've heard that has to do with that running to and fro and knowledge is increased. So that's such a beautiful promise there. And so this is the end of the book of Amos. Again, if you want the inserts, if you're interested in those, please send an email to Bible Note Taking with Katie at gmail.com and I'll send those out to you. And until next time, be well and God bless.